Today on Let the Bible Speak. What is doctrine and how important was it to the New Testament church? Today our series about the church of the Bible continues by looking at its teaching. Good morning and welcome to Let the Bible Speak. Over the past four weeks we have been examining the church revealed in the New Testament, its origin, its form, its government, and its membership. Today we wish to consider its doctrine. Now I can't think of a question about the church that will provoke more controversy than the question, what does the church believe? The reason quite obviously is the religious community is divided in hundreds of ways over what the church should be teaching. Not only are there scores of denominations and religious bodies, but those many organizations and religious traditions differ in belief, name, organization, and practice. Well, one might say, maybe so, but we're united by the most basic tenets of the gospel and nothing else really matters. Well, first it's wrong to say nothing else matters, but I'm not sure it is even correct to say that the religious community is united on basic tenets of the gospel however you may define that and what you may or may not include within that definition. Rather, people claiming to be the church have been segregated into factions and denominational camps for so many centuries until some simply take it for granted that this is the way it was from the beginning. But as Jesus once said in relation to another subject, from the beginning it was not so. Christ and the apostles intended for the church to embrace, preach, and practice one faith, Ephesians 4 verse 4 and Jude verse 3. But this begs the question, what did the church of the New Testament believe? What constituted truth and sound doctrine? For our beginning text, we go back to Acts chapter 2 and the day of Pentecost, the day the Lord's church began on earth. And we read in verses 41 and 42, Then they that gladly received His word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about three thousand souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, and fellowship, and in breaking of bread, and in prayers. Well, there may be many disagreements about doctrine, but we will never even begin to sort out any confusion until we determine where did the doctrine or teaching of the New Testament church come from? That will be the theme of today's study, the doctrine of the New Testament church, after a song from the congregation. Sing to me. To some the word doctrine is intimidating. They think of the simple gospel perhaps as one thing and church doctrine as something entirely different. And they try to avoid discussing doctrine because they believe doctrine divides people or really doctrine is not all that important at the end of the day. It's merely what's in your heart or what your intentions are. 
or they think that doctrine ought to be left in the seminary and basically left out of the pew. Well, friend, the word doctrine simply means teaching, and the Christian should not try to avoid it, but should pursue it. In fact, the church cannot be the church without doctrine. If you have a church without a doctrine, you have a social club or a human organization of some kind, but you don't have a church. You know, we learned last week that the church is made up of disciples of Jesus Christ. And Jesus told His apostles when He commissioned them before returning to heaven to go and make disciples by teaching and baptizing those they taught. So the church is built upon teaching. Well, that's doctrine. Sometimes the Bible calls Christianity the faith, and the faith refers to a body of doctrine or teaching. Now then, not only was it teaching that brought people into the church, but the Bible tells us that the church continued in teaching or doctrine. It continued in the faith. In Acts 2 and verse 42, we learn that those who were baptized on the day of Pentecost and were thus added to the church, that they continued in the apostles' doctrine. Friend, at least 45 times in the King James Version, the word doctrine appears in the New Testament, and in many of those occurrences, great emphasis is placed upon the importance of that doctrine, and not only that, the importance of that doctrine being correct, being from the right source, and being carefully followed and adhered to by the church. You know, Jesus went throughout the land during His ministry proclaiming His doctrine. He came to the world and taught. He taught many wonderful truths about Himself, about His kingdom. When He concluded His Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7 and verse 23, it says, And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at His doctrine. Other translations say His teaching. Uh, in John chapter 7 and verse 16, the, the Bible says that Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but His who sent me. So Jesus came preaching doctrine, and He emphasized its authority by saying that His doctrine came from God the Father. Well, that alone should tell us that doctrine is important. Now, when the apostles later went out into the world preaching the gospel after the establishment of the church, you may recall in Acts chapter 5, they were called to account before the Jewish Sanhedrin and the council saying, Did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. Later on, Paul emphasized the importance of the right doctrine when he told Titus, But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. Titus chapter 2 and verse 1. He likewise exhorted Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 13, Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. The Bible also repeatedly warns against believing and tolerating false doctrine. For example, in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 14, Paul said that God set up and equipped the church in such a way that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. So you see, doctrine matters, and it matters what that doctrine is. Not just any doctrine, not every wind of doctrine, but we are to abide in Christ's doctrine. So the Bible's emphasis upon doctrine should tell us how important it was to the early church, the church we read about in the New Testament. And not only that, that its doctrine be pure, and that its doctrine be carefully preserved, and it be guarded. But the question is, where did the church in the New Testament derive its doctrine? Where or to whom did the first disciples look to as the source of their teaching, and what was their rule of faith? What were they charged with guarding and keeping? Well, when Paul the Apostle wrote to Timothy about his responsibilities as an evangelist, he said in 2 Timothy chapter 1, beginning in verse 13, Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed to you, keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. Now, Timothy was an evangelist working with and developing the church at Ephesus at this time, and Paul wrote to him from his dark and damp prison cell in Rome shortly before he was taken out and executed by Nero. And aside from his personal request for Timothy to come visit him one last time, Paul wrote to charge Timothy to keep the faith that he had received, to hold on, to hold the line, to carefully guard the doctrine that Paul had taught him. 
Now that doctrine of course included the knowledge of the person and redeeming work of Jesus Christ. Everything that is contained within the doctrine of the church is built upon that foundation. But not only that, the doctrine that Timothy was told to cling to contained instruction for how he and the church were to live as individuals and function together as a church. For example, in his first letter to Timothy a few years before, Paul told him that he wanted Timothy to know how to behave himself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. And now in this second letter, he urges Timothy to hold on to the teaching that he had been given. And we notice several things in this text. First of all, he was to hold fast the doctrines he had been taught. He had no right to set them aside. He had no right to ignore them, to replace them with his own teachings. But he was responsible to obey and teach others to obey the things that he had been taught. Number two, the things that he had been taught were to serve as a pattern. Now the word pattern means a form or a sketch. It refers to something that is to be traced or conformed to or imitated. You know, some people try to convince us that, well, there are no patterns in the New Testament and essentially we're free to do as we see fit. But Paul says that the teaching Timothy received was to serve as a pattern for he and the church. Number three, the thing that was to serve as a pattern was sound words. Now that implies that there are words in religion that aren't sound. There is doctrine that is not correct and is not sound because it's not of God. It's not what is revealed. Now how can we tell the difference? Well, number four, Paul says, sound words which you have heard from me, speaking as an apostle. In other words, Timothy was to use Paul's teaching or doctrine as a pattern for himself and for the church that he was responsible to teach. It mattered, you see, where this doctrine came from. No friend, one way is not as good or as right as another. It does matter how a church's beliefs are formed. It does matter where we get our doctrine. It matters what that doctrine is. It matters what we teach and it matters what we practice. Because number five, Paul points out that those teachings he received from Paul were a sacred trust. He says, hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Listen now, that good thing which was committed to you, keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. Now that phrase, which was committed to you, it means, or it's one word in the Greek, which means a deposit, a trust, or a thing consigned to one's faithful keeping. Paul said that the things that he had taught Timothy we're being committed to Him to keep and then to follow. Now, do you ever hear people suggest that what we really need to be worried about is the Sermon on the Mount or the Golden Rule and just try to follow the words of Jesus, the words written in red, and the rest isn't as important. We shouldn't get too mired down and wrapped up in the words of people like Paul. Well, that's not what the early church was to understand. Rather, they were taught by the apostles to respect the words of the apostles as being not only equal to the words of Jesus spoken while He was on earth, but as constituting the words of Jesus as He had now spoken to them from heaven. You see, here's the process or chain of revelation by which the church of the New Testament received its doctrine. Jesus came to earth with a doctrine. He came teaching the things not only concerning the kingdom of Christ itself, but the wonderful truths that those in the kingdom would live by and would follow. He entrusted those teachings to His disciples, those men that He chose, who would remain and carry on when He had completed His redemptive work on earth and returned to heaven to receive His kingdom or build His church. And so in John 14 through 16, shortly before He went to the cross, Jesus promised His disciples who would be commissioned his commissioned apostles in the church, that He would send them the Holy Spirit to teach them all things and help them to remember all of the things that Jesus has spoken, had spoken while He was with them, John 14, verse 26. That He would guide them, the apostles, into all truth, John 16, verse 13. Why would He need to do that? Because these apostles would be His channel of revelation to the church as a whole. He would impart His will to the church through the office of the apostles. That's why those men, personally selected by Christ, trained by Him, endued with power by Christ, 
Those men would serve as the foundation of the church, according to Ephesians 2 and verse 20, and that's why they could claim to be the ambassadors of the King, Jesus Christ, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 20, and why they could claim that Christ was speaking through and by them, 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 3. The writer of Hebrews stated it this way in Hebrews chapter 2, beginning in verse 3. He says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed to us by those who heard Him, God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to His own will. So you see the teaching of the New Testament church was given to follow and to practice, and that came from Christ, was delivered to the office of the apostles. And they not only preached those things that Christ by the Spirit gave them to preach, but they preserved them for the churches throughout the world then and for the centuries to come right on down to our own day and until the Lord comes again. And they preserved those teachings in their writings, the New Testament. Friend, the only creed the New Testament church was ever given to believe, preach, follow, and practice was the inspired instruction of the apostles of Jesus Christ. And to us today, that is the New Testament Scriptures. Now, when you look to any other source for doctrine, division will be the result. You know, some today claim to receive modern revelations from the Holy Spirit and that the church is being supernaturally guided by such. Well, one of the many problems with such a conclusion is which revelations do we follow? You know, there are multitudinous people who claim to be supernaturally and extra-biblically led by the Holy Spirit, but yet we find them preaching different and often conflicting doctrines. So which ones should we listen to? One may say, well, whichever ones are in accord with the Bible. But doesn't that defeat the purpose? I mean, if the Bible already says it, then why do we need a separate revelation? Why not just point to what the Bible already says, what the Holy Spirit's already said in His Word? You see, the apostles received divine revelation and spoke by inspiration, and when they did so, they demonstrated and proved that fact by performing miracles, which no man has the power to do today. And then there are those who believe that the church should have a written creed to unite around. Some denominations and church bodies, they, they recite and confess a certain creed. They are governed by a certain creed. And by written creed, I mean a creed stated and assembled by the church distinct from the scriptures themselves. Well, again, we get back to the question, which creed? We've seen the Westminster Confession, the Philadelphia Confession, going way back to the Apostles' Creed, and I'm talking about the, the, the one uh, distinct from the actual New Testament itself. Which one? Which one do we confess? Which one do we recite? Which one do we subscribe to? Now, I know people will rush to say that such creeds are simply an organization and restating of Bible truth. But friend, I have a hard time believing that because if you read and believe the various creeds, you'll come away with various and different conclusions about things. That's why there are several creeds. Friend, if your church creed simply says what the Bible says, then why do you need that creed? If your creed says more than the Bible says, it says too much. If it says less than the Bible says, it doesn't say enough. If it says exactly what the Bible says, no more and no less, then why not just take the Bible itself? Why do you need the creed that some man has written? Someone else may say, yeah, but it's no different than a tract you distribute about the truth or about the church or the gospel or a sermon that you may preach about the Bible. Oh, but it is different. You see, my sermon has no authority outside of the Bible it contains. A tract may serve like a sermon to explain, help someone understand the teaching of the Bible. But unlike a humanly written church creed, one isn't expected to confess my sermon or confess a tract, and one isn't expected to recite my sermon to be in good standing with the church. My sermon is just a tool or an aid to help people understand what the Word of God says. But a creed goes beyond that. And yes, we must all abide in the truth, but it's the truth because it's what the Bible says and not what a creed, tract, sermon, or set of bylaws or any other writing may say. The creeds which claim to foster unity are ironically the source of division. You see, the church in the New Testament followed no such creed. 
Now I know some point to Acts chapter 15 when the elders and apostles came together at Jerusalem to discuss how to integrate Gentiles into the Jewish church, but the key word there is apostles. This was during the age when Christ's revelation was just beginning and the apostles in their person were overseeing the development of the infant church. That is in no way parallel to men today, uninspired men today, assembling a creed for others to follow. Friend, the New Testament is our creed. The apostles' teaching in the New Testament is our creed if we are like the New Testament church. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That word profitable means it's able to do what it was sent forth to do. It is profitable for doctrine. And then he goes on to say that the man of God may be perfect. That means complete, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. Either the Scriptures thoroughly furnish us to every good work or we need something besides the Scriptures. We need a creed that some group of men write. Well, friend, I believe the Scriptures are sufficient to guide the church. Now, very quickly, what did the doctrine of the New Testament church consist of? It certainly was focused upon the person and the work of Jesus Christ on earth and now in heaven. It was the teaching of Christ crucified, risen again, now exalted as Lord and King, Acts chapter 2 as well as 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It included how one was justified through faith in Christ in obedience to His gospel. Speaking of the Romans' baptism into Christ, Paul said in Romans 6 and verse 17, But God be thanked that though you were the servants of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. Uh, the doctrine included the daily conduct and lifestyle of the Christian, including admonishments for holy living and warnings against sinful and spiritually compromising conduct. It included the way the church should conduct itself in its government, organization, work, and worship. And it includes the believer's future hope of life in the world to come. It is the entire body of the apostles' teaching to the church. It is not only the apostles' teaching about Christ, as some suggest. It is also the teaching of Christ, taught and enforced by the apostles in Christ's kingdom. And then, we might ask the question, are all churches expected to follow the same doctrine? Well, let's listen to Paul as he wrote to Corinth in 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 17. There he said, For this reason I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. You see, Paul didn't allow that one church would believe one thing and another church over here believe something else. And then finally, should we in the 21st century be concerned about following the same doctrine as the church back in the 1st century? Well, we turn to 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 12-15, through 15, where Peter wrote, For this reason I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Yes, I think it is right as long as I am in this tent, that means in this body, living on this earth, to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me, moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. What is Peter saying? The Apostle Peter expected the church to remember and follow his inspired teaching long after his death. I would remind you, my friend, that the doctrine of the church is critically important. It is to be the right doctrine. We should strive to know the truth and believe and practice only the truth. John said in 2 John 1 and verse 9, Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. 1 Timothy 1 and verse 3, As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Friend, if we wish to imitate the church of the New Testament, and that's the only church Jesus established and authorized, we must be committed to learning and following the same doctrine they believed and that they followed.
Connect with us on social media. Go to Facebook.com and search for Let the Bible Speak TV. Today was part five of our series about the New Testament church. And if you would like a free printed copy of the lesson, we'll be happy to send it to you. Ask for the lesson, The Doctrine of the New Testament Church. The Doctrine of the New Testament Church and your free copy will be on its way. You can find us also online, ltbstv.org and our social media platforms. We would sure appreciate it if you would like our Facebook page and subscribe to our YouTube channel and share our content with others. We look forward to connecting with you online. We hope you'll join us back next week when, Lord willing, we will continue our series by talking about the assemblies of the New Testament church. What were they like? What were the assemblies of the New Testament church all about? So be sure to join us if God wills for that study. Hope you have a great week ahead and you'll make your plans to join me back here for our next Bible study together. Until then, may the Lord richly bless you. Let the Bible Speak is brought to you by The Church of Christ. For more information, including our past broadcast and sermon transcripts, visit ltbstv.org. Thanks for being with us today. Join us next time for Let the Bible Speak.